Welcome to the Innovation Room, the space we explore the application of technology and AI in business, the practical and sometimes philosophical ideas shaping our future. In this episode of the Innovation Room, I'm excited to welcome Dr. Shayan Bakare, a seasoned medical doctor with over a decade of experience in urgent care, who has seamlessly blended clinical expertise with a deep focus on AI and digital technology. Dr. Shayan and I first connected during our executive MBA program in Silicon Valley, where we geeked out and bonded over the shared passion of innovation in tech and all the possibilities that it presents in the health tech space. Today, he shares how AI is transforming everything from patient care to diagnostics, and we'll dive into the challenges and the future role of human practitioners in an AI-driven medical world. This is a conversation full of insights and forward-thinking perspectives, one you won't want to miss. I'm Lindsay Jessup, CEO at Geeks. Enjoy this episode of The Innovation Room. Hi, Dr. Than. Thanks for joining me today in The Innovation Room. No problem at all. Thanks so much for having me. I was wondering if you could give us a brief introduction about yourself and your expertise in healthcare and AI for our audience. Absolutely. Um, so I'm Sean Bakary. I trained as a medical doctor. During my training, I undertook a dual membership in both hospital and general practice. And what I wanted was to have both the breadth of general practice, but also the depth of knowledge of sort of hospital medicine. Um, at the end of my training, I did a Darcy Fellowship. So I was appointed as a Darcy Fellow. And that was a year long fellowship into sort of leadership strategy and innovation. And we would, I was deployed along with my sort of other colleagues to uh, large institutions, hospitals within central London to act as a change agent to drive quality improvement and innovation. I think that was the beginning of my journey. And I was also with a view to looking at, you know, in future, going into sort of different endeavors that may involve, you know, innovation, strategy, driving quality and things. So I've qualified um, in 2014 and I've spent sort of, you know, the last decade or so um, working as an urgent care physician. Um, my exposure to um, different sort of digital technology and AI systems in that space has been mostly with um, electronic medical records, decision support tools, and that has evolved as time has gone on to sort of the use of AI in extra reporting and other things. And I guess most recently, I undertook an executive MBA, which is where you and I met. Yeah. Um, and I concentrated that on digital technology and innovation, which has provided lots of exposure to analytics, machine learning algorithms, and how this can be leveraged in sort of business and industry. I'm so glad you mentioned that, actually, because I was going to jump in at the end and say, um, for I'll share a little bit with our audience how we met was actually on our executive MBA, even though we were in different cohorts, we met in Silicon Valley. And something that struck me with you, even though we were from um, different domains, um, you were geeking out with me in our sessions almost <laughs> as much as anyone. And, I, and that's where I was like, I need to get him on the podcast because I love um, the curious mindset and the uh, innovation that you're bringing to your space. So thank you so much uh, for sharing. Thank you, Lindsay. So big question. We always ask our guests, to say, if you could bring anyone into the innovation room to help you drive innovation, who would it be and why? They can be dead or alive, fictional or non-fictional. Okay, so this is a toughie. Um, I was torn between two sort of boundary-spanning thinkers, alive, not dead. Mm. Um, and they are what you consider sort of modern day polymaths. And those two individuals are Neil deGrasse and slightly controversial, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Mm -hmm. a slightly controversial uh, character at the moment, Elon Musk. Um, oh. I ultimately decided on Elon because I feel a lot of his products and his endeavors and his initiatives are truly catalyzing sort of unprecedented advancements and sort of advancements and sort of solutions to sort of modern day challenges and problems. And they are, I think, I don't want to overstate it, but I believe they are potentially redefining sort of what we consider societal progress. If you look at things like Neuralink, if you look at things like SpaceX, if you look at, you know, those endeavors, he's also co-founded OpenAI. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, those things are literally changing, I think, the trajectory of where we're going as a civilization. Um, again, without wanting to overstate things. Which, which I'm, I'm no, I think, I think, I mean, well, very well put. Um, and I think, you know, Elon can be a polarizing figure, but very few people can. I would like to see someone challenge that he is not uh, one of the leading, if not the leading innovator. So, um, I completely see where Precisely. you're coming from. And I think, you know, as far as, you know, we're discussing innovation, you know, he was, he has a proven track record of sort of just a certain sort of prescient mindset. You know, he came mm -hmm. up with PayPal. Yeah. You know, he, he was, and at that time, you know, I, I always sort of marvel at these sort of people with the ability to sort of see technology and believe in, you know, endeavors that, the rest of us, you know, I can't imagine the number of naysayers at that time, but to have sort of the self-belief and see it through and then to continue, mm. you know, Neuralink in medicine, you know, bridging the brain machine interface, and, you know, mm. we're, we're allowing paraplegic individuals who are unable to sort of move or communicate to literally use the, you know, their mind and their thought to control mm. machines, objects, computers, it's, yeah, I mean, it's literally, we are living in the future. It's what I grew up watching as science fiction, so. It's so true, and it takes a really uh, special individual to be able to literally just walk through life only really <laughs> obeying the laws of physics, if that makes sense, and understanding <laughs> that, but then everything else is, you know, um, beyond the first principles can be uh, innovated, and I think that that's a true visionary, so. I completely agree. So um, we we talked a little bit before about um, our Derrida bullseye framework and going through uh, that model of thinking about the stakeholders, the constraints, and trying to imagine the future of healthcare and AI. And you did a great job of setting the scene a bit about your background and and, and what your sort of focus in A and E and general practice and private. You have quite a, a breadth and depth to your exposure, uh, career and exposure to these technologies. So um, I'm gonna start with the more broad stakeholders in healthcare, but feel free to make it more specific to um, to your areas of healthcare if, if you wish. So starting with um, stakeholders, how is AI changing the expectations and experiences of stakeholders like your patients, your providers, insurance, insurers uh, in healthcare? And how do you think sure. AI more future thinking five years ten years okay perfect well i mean it's it is truly transformative i mean i guess if i start with patients first of all um where we're going at the moment is really i guess honing in on our ability to create personalized treatment plans mm -hmm. for these patients so you know we have ai driven apps and chatbots for instance that are on 24 7 that helps us to increase and drive engagement and accessibility as well. Mm -hmm. So patients now are being transformed from passive recipients of their care to active participants who are proactive in their health management. That's one. The other one is sort of predict, and I think we'll probably get on get a bit more into this later on in the sort of you know the discussion. But predictive analytics for disease prevention mm -hmm. and you know using the Internet of Things, wearables. Um, and AI to effectively look at patterns in our behavior um, and draw on different data sources to help us anticipate when things go wrong so we can action it before, you know, we actually get to a state where disease is set in and it's more costly to treat and effectively manage. And then improve diagnostic accuracy as well. You know, it, we'll, again, I imagine we'll sort of go more into this later, um, but you know, the ability of sort of models trained on huge data sets mm -hmm. and then AI's ability to, I guess, it, 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 I don't think it's going to supplant sort of human beings, but, you know, it, the level of sort of scrutiny and accuracy of sort of AI in assessing an image, for instance, far exceeds that of a human already. Like, you know, AI models are outperforming human beings in sort of reading, sort of imaging and diagnostics. So we'll come a bit more onto that, I think. And in terms of providers, um, 
it truly is sort of something I've touched on already, which is the radiology and the AI interpretation um, for providers that's able to, it allows them, I guess, to streamline um, their sort of services. So in urgent care, for instance, um, the throughput, patients come with an expectation um, of being seen and being sort of, you know, having their investigations and leaving in a sort of relatively timely manner. Um, the rate limiting step often is in interpreting these scans and getting a formal report for these scans, automating that with sort of AI and having that reader is transforming the sort of the level of service, the speed of service that we're able to provide, right? Um, and then if we move slightly away from the clinical aspect and we look at administrative tasks, so AI is able to sort of effectively automate simple things like scheduling and billing, you know, all of that is sort of effectively been taken over. I imagine not just in sort of this space, but in multiple industries as well. Yeah. And then finally, we look at decision support systems that I touched on previously. This isn't new necessarily, but it's looking at really personalizing the suggestions and recommendations made based on the data provided, as opposed to a sort of generic sort of, you know, just suggestions that it may be this, it may be that, based on purely on statistical probability. Um, so there are sort of things like IBM Watson's oncology recommendations, mm. um, and that's been used to sort of really tailor treatment planning by analyzing sort of vast amounts of medical literature and patient data to provide effectively sort of really personalized, hyper-individualized sort of care plans for these patients. And then for insurers, you know, we look at things like risk assessment, fraud detection, personalized insurance plans for sort of high risk um, patients so that, you know, we can really tailor these plans to them. And then claims processing as well. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with Ping An. That's mm -hmm. a, it's a Chinese sort of uh, insurer. And they've managed to use AI to get claims processing down to a matter of seconds. Wow. Literally seconds, right? And so efficiency, customer satisfaction, all of that is vastly enhanced by the use of AI as well. Very cool. Very interesting. And what do you think are the most of all of the changes? If you had to pick one or the two most significant changes that could be brought to both public and private healthcare sectors, what would they be? Hmm. Okay. So the, in terms of, I'll divide them if, if, if I may, right? Yep. So in terms of the public sector, I think it's going to be operational efficiency is one. Just because, you know, as you're probably familiar within the universalized healthcare system of not just the NHS, I guess other countries who have that, but even the privatized healthcare system as well, the demand for services and cost inflation is something that we're really having to sort of address and deal with. I think increased mm -hmm. operational efficiency, automating certain routine tasks um, will reduce a operational costs but also improve resource allocation as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's critical and necessary, especially in a system like the NHS, right? I think two, we already mentioned it and sort of discussed this slightly already, but diagnostic accuracy. And the point, the critical point about that is that if we're, if AI is able to allow us to detect diseases earlier in their sort of clinical pathway, we can literally save billions in costs, you know, or potentially save mm -hmm. billions and the cost of actually then sort of treating the disease where it's at a sort of florid state, where we're treating not just the disease, but the complications of the disease and the wider sort of far reaching implications of that in terms of, you know, missing work days, in terms of impact on family, in terms of sort of psychological and mental health impact as well. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that sort of increased diagnostic accuracy, early detection, I think is also going to be critical within the public sector, private and public, but mostly the public, right, where we're looking at sort of preventative health in order to keep a lid on sort of spiraling costs, right? Mm -hmm. And then predictive analytics, which you've discussed already, right? But now not on an individual basis, if we're using AI to look at sort of population-based sort of disease trends, patterns, mm -hmm. outbreaks, we've seen it recently, right, with COVID, Right. Imagine we had AI const constantly and consistently monitoring sort of global disease patterns. We, we may be able to anticipate this and curtail the spread a lot sooner. Right. In a way mm -hmm. that wouldn't we wouldn't then incur 
you know, not just the economic sort of injury that we did during COVID, not just the sort of loss of life and the, you know, emotional injury that's been suffered, but also for sort of generations to come, you know, we had kids, children that were born in this time whose worldview and life experience has been sort of warped in a way that we're now having to correct. Um, so yeah, that that's as far as sort of the public sector is concerned. And I guess in the private sector, the name of the game is really personalized care. That, that, that in the private sector, that, that really is the name of the game. Um, it's about sort of hyper-individualized care um, that will, will use AI to take sort of analytics from their sort of genetics, from lifestyle, from environmental data to really tailor treatments, right? And what is the point of tailoring? Is to minimize side effects and costs and optimize sort of benefits in terms of outcomes, right? We want to sort of trim the fat we don't want to sort of, you know, broadly say, just take this medication or take this treatment plan that is adapted to every, you know, that is generalized for everyone. We want mm -hmm. it to be hyper individualized to you personally. Mm -hmm. And that way we know that you're only getting precisely what you need and nothing else. So, so there's no wastage. On, if I were to take that more and extrapolate it, because there's so much interesting information in there. But it sounds to me like at the different parts of the journey, getting everything from the predictive analytics root cause through, um, you know, insurance and claims being less hassle and, you know, addressed quicker and making, you know, it less of a barrier for people to actually, some people don't go through the process just because of that hassle, for example. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So they might not even go through with their healthcare plans, et cetera. So do you think generally the theme would be that we could expect life outcomes, like people to be living longer with the, do you think AI will help people live longer is what I was thinking when you're saying that, do you think that we'll all be centarians in the next, uh, you know, couple of decades? Will we see those lifestyle ch changes? I, I, I truly believe we will. And Ooh. I think it will be for, well a, couple, well, a couple of reasons sort of spring to mind initially with the use of, if we're being more anticipatory in the care that we provide. Um, so a move from sort of reactive to proactive healthcare provision, reactive being a lot more costly because, mm -hmm. you know, for reasons discussed earlier, to sort of proactive healthcare, we're then gonna catch diseases earlier. It means that the likelihood of treatment success is that much higher. So it means that people won't be succumbing necessarily to, you know, not just chronic disease, but, you know, diseases that could effectively be life limiting in the short term, like mm -hmm. cancer and other things, right? And then we look at the capability of AI. Well, I, I think we may come on to this a bit later, but I'll touch on it now in terms of um, disease modeling and looking at therapeutic targets for certain conditions. And, you know, it's able to identify data sets that are so vast and make connections that we as humans, even, you know, in the largest labs and the biggest sort of clinical foundations that we're, we're just not able, we don't have the computational power to sort of achieve ourselves you know, with the limitation of the human mind, how many there are, right? So we're now sort of drug discovery, treatment discovery, that's also going to mean that we're able to not just catch diseases earlier, but also treat them with therapies that are more likely to be successful, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to live longer in that way as well. Mm -hmm. And I think just from the point of view of, again, like I said, trimming the fat, right? So, you know, cancer management at the moment, it, we're making huge advances, right, in our ability to, you know, tailor cancer treatment with, you know, things like genomics and immunotherapy that looks at the actual cancer and the receptors and then creates and stimulates the immune system to fight that particular tumor. But it also has potentially quite debilitating side effects as well, right? And yeah. I think the ability to you know, really refine those therapies such that, you know, we have the upside, but less of the downside mm -hmm. will also see us definitely living, living longer. Game changer. Really, really interesting. So now um, 
like I feel excited about the potentials, also the challenges that will come with the expectation change as mm -hmm. um, you know stakeholders become more and more aware that these technologies can achieve those things. Obviously the bar will continue to go up, up and up and up. So let's move into the constraint part and challenges part then and start to think about what's getting in our way. So what are the primary constraints and challenges of integrating AI into healthcare? And obviously you and I both know that there are some pretty advanced technologies already out there. So why aren't we seeing that more a mass right now? And how can these be navigated more effectively in your opinion? Okay. So I guess there, 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 there are a few points that I'll, that I'll touch on. I think to begin with and within the healthcare sector, right? It's going to be sort of, integration within existing systems and interoperability that, that that's going to be sort of a huge challenge at the moment right there is, a is no real consistency across the different sort of electronic health record systems used by the various hospitals at the various levels right there's, there's no real consistency amongst them and so you know and some you know some of them are quite dated some of them are more modern but making sure that we can integrate that AI to within existing systems is going to be a challenge. The solution to that would be to use sort of cloud-based solutions, mm -hmm. for instance, and APIs that are easier to integrate because they're cloud-based. So things like Google Cloud Healthcare API, that, that, that may work. I know currently the electronic health record system that I use within my urgent care is completely cloud-based. Um, and so it also improves and helps with accessibility as well. So, you know, not, to not, not that I'm encouraging people taking their work home necessarily, mm. but, you know, if I'm at home and I need to check up, you know, a patient's results or, you know, there's something outstanding that I need to check from anywhere in the world with a, the secure connection, of course, I can mm. check that. So, yeah, so integration within existing systems, interoperability, that, that, that's one thing, right? Um, I think we have to be mindful also of uh, sort of data privacy and mm. security. Um, as you can imagine within medicine, especially, right? So you have to have ro really robust cybersecurity measures, right? Mm -hmm. that have, and there has to be absolute adherence to sort of regulations like GDPR in the UK and Europe and then HIPAA in the United States. Um, and I guess, you know, looking at that, some strategies that have been deployed so far, looking at federated learning techniques that don't, that means that AI doesn't have to sort of centralize any sensitive data, but it can sort of, I guess, interpret these locally without having to, you know, amass and hoard lots and lots of sort of sensitive patient data um, as a potential solution for that. Uh, we look at, um, I think about things like the actual AI itself, and there are concerns about bias and fairness mm -hmm. within the AI. Um, because, you know, of course, the data set that is trained on, you know, the, uh, the, the there's an adage that sort of speaks about, you know, poor quality in and then sort of poor quality out. I think mm -hmm. it's, I, I've paraphrased that. I think it's, it's <laughs> very yeah, close. Cool. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I think the, and then that then leads to sort of unequal sort of treatment outcomes. And mm -hmm. that's, we have to avoid at all costs. And I think, you know, some solutions that have been looked at and addressing that is just ensuring sort of diversity and representation within the data sets that are used. And, you know, that, that's, that's crucial. And also using sort of de-biasing or bias detection software that can correct some of these mechanisms. So IBM's AI Fairness 360 Toolkit, for instance, is such one such sort of tool that's being used and deployed at the moment. Hmm. And, and regulatory compliance, you know, healthcare, as you can imagine, we absolutely need um, sort of very tight sort of regulate regulations. You know, we need to navigate that that regulatory landscape that can be quite complex. You know, across regions, you know, across different sort of jurisdictions. You know, it, 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 we need to make sure that all of that is very tight. I think AI is advancing at a, at a rate beyond what the regulators are able to keep up with at the moment. Mm. And so, you know, we're, we're seeing and witnessing potential that outstrips, you know, 
regulations in place to, I guess, govern and manage its use. Yeah. Um, and that's a little bit of an issue at the moment. We're seeing not just within medicine, right, but within sort of all different sort of platforms within digital technology, uh, social mm -hmm. media, things as well. Um, but there are moves and strides towards, you know, establishing, you know, regulatory bodies that bridge the gap between healthcare and sort of, you know, AI firms and companies. Um, IDX Doctor uh, is the first FDA approved digital system, for instance, for a specific condition, diabetic retinopathy, but that's received regulatory approval to be deployed and used as in the US. So it's not saying it can't be done, but it's just mm -hmm. that we have to remain mindful of that. And I think a sort of not, a, yeah, a lack, a, a, the opacity mm -hmm. sort of around regulations may serve as a barrier to adoption for, you know, many people, many sort of organizations within healthcare. Being someone like yourself who is um, pretty visionary for understanding, not, and, and, um, I think this is pretty a fair statement, but correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm sure most physicians aren't as tech savvy as yourself, for example. Um, what do you, knowing what's possible and some of the the potential that you're you're experiencing, what are the things that are frustrating you in this? Like, what are the things that you just wish you could get your hands on or you could move forward if you had a magic wand? Really interesting. Okay. Um... For me, at the moment, I think the re something that would really change the game is AI's ability to help us automate certain tasks that are that seem just really sort of menial at the moment, right? So, for instance, something simple like taking the medical history, mm. right? Um, I'm I spend the time, you know getting the history from the patient, discussing their symptoms, uh, clinical condition, examining them, so on and so forth. And then there's a whole other sort of period of time that is spent writing up and typing the clinical notes for this encounter. Now, there's a trade-off that has to be made, right? Um, because there are loads of patients to see all of the time. It's either something has to give. So I either spend the time creating that connection with the patient, establishing a rapport, but then the notes are relatively sort of, you know, shorthand and scanty. The point of the medical notes are to act as a ledger, if you like, for the next clinician or doctor that reads them in order to, you know, pass on that clinical baton to say, this is what's happened at this time. This is the potential implications or impact for what they're presenting with now. If the notes are scanty and written in shorthand, they're no, not very much used to so if we had, and it, they already exist, but they're just not yet sort of integrated into, but if we had an AI assisted electronic health record system that was able to effectively act as a scribe, hmm. but not just a, you know, transcription tool, not basically like that, the ones that exist at the moment will transcribe what is being said and in real time, format it into a medical template. So when we make our notes, it's not just, you know, typing, you know, it's in a sort of pretty stylized format. And what the AI can do is take what is said to be just a conversation, draw out the salient regions of that conversation and then populate this. Mm -hmm. Having done so, it will then provide a list of differentials and a management plan at the end which is designed to, as a buttress to your own clinical judgment, not to mm -hmm. supplant your own clinical judgment. I think that would be game changing, not least because, you know, it would then mean we had both sides of the equation. The patients get, well, it will actually focus and benefit the patients mm -hmm. more because then we could concentrate more of our time on really establishing that rapport, really making sure the patient understands mm -hmm. the management and what they're leaving with, right? Well, definitely. Um, I love that because I think that when we get to what the role of human is in this future world, I think that is going to be one of the most important examples of the things that will help supercharge physicians or nurses or other staff um, to be able to give 
to either listen, communicate, um, all, all of the important things that AI can't do. Um, the interesting thing to me, though, is, um, and I, I know we were talking about this previously, but some of these things already exist. So what is actually stopping it from being in your hands oh, already? Okay. So it depends on whether or not you practice or function, I guess, as a um, as a sole sort of provider of medical services or whether or not you work in a large organization. Large organizations, of course, as you're aware, Mm -hmm. sort of suffering from a degree of organizational inertia. You know, we have mm -hmm. to look at organizational readiness for adoption of these technologies. Mm -hmm. We both know that, you know, mere superiority of a practice or a tool is not enough to guarantee its adoption, right? Yeah. We have to consider the sort of various patterns of interest. We have to look at the micropolitics involved. We have to look at, you know, how do we make this a compelling proposition for the patterns of, you know, I guess effort is going to be required, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do we make this, you know, we have to contextualize this and really sell it to the different stakeholders to make, and at each level, we have to make it, you have to adapt the proposition at each level. Mm -hmm. So I guess at, you know, if we're talking about sort of shareholder level, we have to look at how we can increase productivity, um, mm -hmm. how we can increase turnover, how we can sort of, uh, maintain and manage sort of reputation, how we can look at growth from a shareholder mm -hmm. level. I guess from, you know, if you're looking at it, the, the sort of doctor, sort of clinician on the ground, you should mm -hmm. look at, you know, how it improved their decision making. Um, you can look at how it can accelerate and advance and enhance their sort of use of diagnostics. Um, and I guess we're looking at from sort of just the hospital organization itself, depending on whether it's private or uh, public, you know, the things we've already discussed, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that's the main thing in, in the big hospitals organizations that I work, that I've worked in, the one I'm working currently, there is a degree of organizational inertia sort of attached to, you know, adopting these. We interestingly are undergoing a huge um, digital transformation project mm -hmm. where we're overhauling our entire so electronic health record system across all of the different levels of care, primary straight through to tertiary care. Mm. It's a massive undertaking. It's been sort of several years in the making and we're looking to sort of launch in a phased way mm. um, in 2025. Um, but I think, you know, and also it's the users as well, right? Mm. So those people using the technology yeah. that you need to make sure understand it and see it as a tool that can benefit them as opposed to a threat. Mm. I imagine we'll come on to this later, but there are lots of people, even within medicine, that feel threatened at the possibility that, you know, this AI may, instead of complementing their role, mm. may be used to supplant them. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, it, it's really interesting you say that and because obviously what we do and what I do is not industry specific, but there's certain themes because of that that I can see through everyone and you kind of hit the nail on the head of what I was wondering if that was one of the main obstacles because it usually is and it comes down to culture and um, you know, ultimately culture and willingness to engage in the right skills and champions of these kinds of changes and and um, that is probably, I would say, a cross industry challenge, <laughs> because especially if you think about the healthcare sector and like, let's not forget, we did just go through a big global pandemic that was super, super demanding and taxing on our healthcare professionals globally. So now, <laughs> now AI is upon us and that's forcing, as you said, you already talked about issues with data structure, you have regulations you're up against, you have organizational politics and culture and design. And really, I think there's going to have to be some some change in leadership and thinking in these in, in both private and, and public pretty radically. <laughs> Otherwise, it's, it's going to be so as an outsider, and um, because I think patients, and you'll know better than me, and I know I'm um, more techie than others. But people in, in other industries and myself are getting used to um, as you said, chatbots, different ways to engage, the the barriers and the willingness to engage in different means and having virtual appointments and, you know, um, that 
people are more open to that now and the expectation is only going to to increase so i actually see as you said that inertia being a, a big challenge but a big opportunity if if that could just be kind of some of the layers just kind of washed away from that and let people like yourself or other people in organizations lead some of these big um you know more transformative pieces and and deliver it in smaller chunks not in a way that needs to be you know three five years down the road like their wins that could be brought in today so um i definitely hope that some of those frictions and um, you'll start to see change and culture change um within within the sector in the hopefully coming months not even years i i look i think you know organization in order to remain relevant especially in the private sector um will have no choice but to really embrace and adopt these technologies look we're living in the age of sort of you know digital natives right mm -hmm. these individuals so you know late millennials um gen z like their expectation is of hyper convenience not convenience mm -hmm. that you and i expect mm -hmm. they want hyper convenience they want it mm -hmm. on demand whether or not we like it, that's just the way society is moving, right? Yeah. They expect that of all of their other services that mm. they sort of engage with in sort of life from their sort of gym app-based, from their sort of car rides app-based, from what, whatever tools they use at work or now sort of, mm. you know, AI sort of assisted. Healthcare is really going to be you no know, different. If you want to remain, I'm talking about the private sector now, competitive within this field and market, you are mm. absolutely going to have to embrace this and leverage AI to provide conveniences for these patients, you know? So, yeah, yeah I, I don't see that there's going to be a choice sort of relatively soon. I think it's going to be a compulsion. Yes, yeah. I I completely agree. So that actually kind of segued is this next, uh, next well into the third component, which is um, your offering. So what will healthcare professionals, so general practices, public, private, what do you think um, the core proposition will be and, and the key problems basically that um, you will be solving and how will AI change this proposition? I know you already touched on some of the hyper-personalization, the care, the predictive analytics. Um, so I know we covered some of those things, but are there any other critical issues and, and the diagnostics that I should also say, are there any other critical issues that you think will change the expectation and offering of healthcare providers? I think AI drug discovery. Mm. I mean, I touched on it already. Uh, there's a field of research called in silica research that uses um, sort of data modeling and AI now uh, to look at therapeutic targets for therapeutic targets with either, you know, in, in the infectious diseases realm, therapeutic mm. targets within the genome of the virus or bacteria itself. Uh, and we saw that, you know, within the, you know, in the development of sort of vaccines and things for the COVID-19 pandemic we just witnessed, it was, you know, it's really drastically reducing the time to market. So from sort of discovery to actual sort of being ready for deployment, it's truncated that time significantly. You know, we're talking about not sort of by days or weeks, we're talking about years, you know, right. in, so that, I think that will absolutely revolutionize and sort of transform things. Um, we, I mentioned the personalization and things that, 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 that those are the sort of really big things within sort of private healthcare that will be, um, uh, used. And I, I guess to mention now what we're using, what's in place today in terms of, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Google DeepMind, mm -hmm. it's an AI screening tool for breast cancer. Mm -hmm. It's my, I think there, there was a, there was an article published sort of within the last sort of couple of weeks. Um, that. that's, uh, did you see it? That I did. Yeah, the, the, the scan of what they yes. predicted. Yes, that's incredible. Yeah. So two yeah. years, two years before actual sort of a clinically apparent sort of lump or mass that could be detected by the human eye, the AI is managing to sort of, I mean, that that's game, completely game changing, completely mm. game changing. Um, <clears throat> so again, I don't think it's that, that it will supplant 
sort of the humans and there are there will always be elements that we can offer uh that ai is going to find difficult and you know machines will find difficult to sort of you know replicate or mimic um you know empathy you know certain aspects of communication um selectively ignoring certain pieces of data or information those are things that are uniquely sort of human uh traits uh that i think can be difficult to engineer you know in a sort of machine learning algorithm or something like that um and then we have sort of precision medicine um so we're looking at sort of again just tailoring treatments but it the fundamental thing about this is if you imagine doing less whilst achieving more i think that has to be the holy grail right mm. so if we know for instance we've done so we look at the field of nutrigenomics and applying sort of ai data sets to that in a space whereby you know you can now tell an individual instead of you know starving yourself of this entire list of you know foods or nutritional groups we can say targeted specifically lindsay this particular flavor of ice cream is not good for you but these other ice creams are fine so knock yourself out i'm being a little bit facetious i'm you know i'm overdoing it a little yeah. bit but you know we're talking about you know that degree and level of precision is going yeah. to be completely game changing in terms of just making sure that the management that we're delivering is achieving optimal gains with far less of the downside and waste so that I that's think, really exciting yeah that really resonates me uh, with me rather um from a point of view of helping people cuz one of the things that i had in my mind is living longer <laughs> might not be so in terms of patient experience or outcomes it, it might not be everyone's desire necessarily to live a longer life if it's not a fuller life right so um that kind of pairs well nicely with it it doesn't mean that you can have better life expectancy outcomes it doesn't mean that you're going to live if if all of these other areas advance in the ways that you're saying that very possibly it's looking like it's already possible like the predictive um and like early treatment so you're not in the chronic condition or uncomfortable phases perhaps of disease or if you're able to not become intolerant or um uncomfortable and unable to process certain things but actually you can still uh, live a life without too many limits and things like that that actually could not just expand life but massively increase quality of life i think i think you know it will absolutely i think we're at the sort of the dawn of a renaissance within the way we deliver and even sort of look at sort of healthcare honestly i think the ability for sort of machine learning algorithms and ai to assess and analyze data sets that would be sort of incomprehensible for us to sort of even hope even with you know all of the teams around like it, it's 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 changing it it will allow us to ask questions that we didn't know to ask mm -hmm. before and i think that will feel discovery and completely change the way that we think about certain problems that exist within medicine um you know you mentioned predictive healthcare right you know we're we're looking at using the internet of things mm -hmm. right in order to provide continuous monitoring so for instance i know in japan you know they're developing and I think you've we discussed we may discuss previously you know toilets mm -hmm. that for instance will analyze your stool again to sort of predict your sort of gut microbiome which has so many far reaching sort of impacts on not just your physical but also we're discovering your mental health as yeah. well um you know imagine ai as sort of you know your personal assistant if you like just scanning your social media looking at your buying patterns and trends and i guess looking at your sort of i guess uh, social activity right and using that to predict your mental health and in those for instance with a sort of established mental health sort of challenge or difficulty or disorder using that to predict when 
they're going to suffer a crisis. Mm. You know what I mean? By looking at whether or not, you know, their buying patterns, if they're, if they're social posts, if they're becoming more withdrawn from in terms of not, you know, undertaking as many social activities and then using that to either alert them because the challenge and, you know, the, the, the real, yeah, the real challenge with certain mental health conditions is that as part of their condition, they they lose insight into what is actually happening, you know, in, in a manic phase, you know, where you have, you know, individuals uh, because of the disturbance to the way they're able to think and process, um, they, they cannot see. But if we had sort of effectively sort of AI looking over our shoulder, analyzing different facets of you know this individual's life and being able to alert a healthcare provider to say look this is what's happening it may be that you know we're heading in this direction i think it's going to be game changing it really is yeah i really love this and one thing i love and we, i know we chatted about this before we um did the podcast but um I really love that we're having a very glass half full conversation about this because I think there's a lot of conversations around fear with AI, especially, and we can't ignore the regulation, the ethics and the things that we touched on today. Um, but what I love with that example is it, I, I feel personally, and also what I see happen around me in my environment is a lot of people are either because of the inconvenience or fear not getting things checked out or not engaging um, soon enough. But if it's becoming a, an environmental norm, even if I think about, I have a whoop on my wrist now, the wearables you're talking about, it's becoming part of my life to see data and to understand my body in a way I haven't before. It's normalizing things that often people were afraid to know about themselves before. Um, so I think it's, it's removing a barrier that psychologically <laughs> that we didn't even know we have. And then he took it to another level about how it can help even people with other barriers, perhaps with mental health. So I think I think that's really cool. And it kind of segues us on to the now the final section really nicely, which is the role of humans in this AI enhanced um, healthcare uh, environment. So what do you think the key role of humans are in this space? You already touched on empathy, um, and perhaps um, another level of decision making on top of, you know, data sets and outcomes and diagnostics. But what else do you think um, will be the role of human in healthcare? Sure. So I think, you know, with AI automating sort of various sort of administrative tasks, you know, medical note sort of taking, you know, structuring the anamnesis, all that stuff, I think doctors will be able to focus a lot more of their attention on the patient interaction that I mentioned earlier, right? So in terms of sort of really sort of relationship building and really establishing that rapport with the patient to create that enduring um, sort of connection that lasts beyond the consultation room, right? So we know that patients, for instance, retain anywhere between 11 and 15% of what is discussed in the consultation just I thought was staggering right because you know the assumption I've made is that you know we have the discussion I mentioned that you know the management for it is this 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 and this and my expectation this was a long time ago now was that you know sure you remember you go away and you action that and it's you know imagine my horror to discover that not only is it not remembered but that actually you know in terms of implementing the recommendations from the consultation you know it's only a fraction of the time that patients are able to a remember and b you know implement these right yeah. so establishing that you know really sort of you know strong rapport with the patient and that focus i think will be something that we're now sort of shifting our focus on and to mm -hmm. we've been, it's not to say that we haven't been doing it before i remember even in med school you know bedside teaching and bedside manner and all the you know mm -hmm. these are big topics that were you know but with all the operational challenges that we have within sort of, you know, healthcare provision at the moment and service delivery, it's difficult, you know, mm -hmm. something, something has to give. And often we have to prioritize just outcomes, just being able to get these diagnostics yeah. done and being able to, you know, mm -hmm. so that's one. I think um, there will be a role for us to act as sort of supervision, supervisors and interpret, and interpreters of what the AI is 
sort of outputting and making sure it aligns within the clinical context. So I've, you know, often had fun with things, you know, like ChatGPT or Claude or whatever, and, you know, giving it a list of symptoms just out of curiosity to see what it comes out with. And context is really, really important, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think helping to, I guess, with the training of these um, algorithms will be a role for sure. Um, I think in terms of complex decision making, right? So there will be sort of in, in situations where the AI is uncertain or a situation that call for human empathy and where that's crucial, you know, I think it will require sort of, you know, human experts in that in order to deliver. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, patient communication. Mm -hmm. So you know, that goes without saying, right? But translating sort of AI insights into actionable patient advice is going to be something that, you know, mm -hmm. there will be a role in that as well. You can ask ChatGPT or, you know, Claude or whichever, you know, mm -hmm. whatever you like you know, about how you go about managing this. Patients, you, the part of the art of medicine is being able to contextualize this information and deliver it to the patients in a, in a, in a, in a manner that they'll understand. There's mm -hmm. no one size fits all. So, you know, we can, we can look across multiple different sort of domains. So, you know, gender, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. The way I'd communicate it between males and females, because I know that the way Males and females communicate their symptoms is different, mm. right? And we're just beginning to learn the, the very classical, you know, heart attack, you know, patients clutching their chest, and you know, you know we know that that's actually that's that, that's a male that that was based on sort of studies of males, specifically uh, middle-aged sort of males in terms of that symptom presentation. We now know that females, women, present quite differently. Women having heart attacks present so you know gender lines, cultural lines. So maybe speak the exact same language, but the culture, right? And how you communicate your sort of element or what's troubling you is, can be very different across. So patient communication, I think is gonna be really important. AI, I think is gonna struggle for a long time to yeah. you know, catch up with, you know, understanding the nuances of delivering the message in a way that is compelling for the patient in front of them at that time, right? We adapt it literally from patient to patient, the exact same message, but you have to adapt it from patient to patient. So what if you were to be able to go to medical schools now and reinvent the way medical training is for the future? What are the skills and the types of training that you would um, think are most important? So it was interesting you mentioned bedside manner. How would that change or other aspects like AI model training? Should that go in there? Um, Absolutely. What, what are the things that Absolutely. do you need to happen? So, that, to the so digital literacy and fluency, mm -hmm. I think, is an absolute must. Understanding how to use the AI tools, not just how to use them, but also their limitations as well, right? So interpreting their outputs. And then we need to be proficient with these things as far as i'm aware this is the sort of this is the shift and this is the direction of travel mm -hmm. so without this i think people soon find themselves sort of very quickly left behind right i think uh critical thinking so being able to take the information the outputs of ai but sort of in understanding this these recommendations and integrating them you know using their own medical expertise that, that that's going to be sort of huge Data management, you know, it's in, it, that, that's going to be absolutely critical, right? So, in terms of um, just understanding, you know, how to use data sets, how to sort of, you know, derive, um, sort of, well, apply the AI to sort of establish and derive patterns in certain disease processes and things, ethics and regulation. This is already taught in med school but i think it's going to need to be adapted we're not taught about sort of ethics or ethical considerations in the mm -hmm. and regulatory requirements for the use of ai you know we're taught it you know in terms of you know beneficence and non-maleficence and you know the classical sort of ethical underpinnings but we're now going to sort of need to adapt that to what it means for ai i think we're going to need to teach interdisciplinary collaboration so, you know, we're going to need to be able to work closely with sort of, you know, AI developers, data scientists in order to really 
leverage the full potential of this, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess really honing in because hopefully with all of the um, automation that will take place that will allow us to focus more on patient interaction, right? Just really honing in on that sort of empathy and communication and enhancing mm -hmm. these uniquely human skills in order to really augment the experience for the patient. You know, I think those are going to be really critical. Mm. And then adaptability, because, you know, we need to foster sort of intellectual curiosity, continual learning, because this is changing at such an accelerated rate that, you know, you're going to need to maintain sort of that. Luckily, within medicine, it's a light, you're, you're committing yourself to a lifelong learning journey anyway. So mm. I think it shouldn't be too much of an ask. Um, but yeah, that's going to absolutely be necessary. So now not just for medicine, but also digital technology and AI as well. Nice. And parting words then, as we wrap up, um, I've really enjoyed this conversation and I could ask you a million questions. I think we found that even when we were prepping for this. But one thing I'd like to ask you just to wrap up is any advice you have for business leaders in healthcare, if you would want them to, you know, take some words of wisdom um, regarding AI integration in healthcare, what would it be? Okay, I have a few, so you may have to bear with me. Oh, I'd love to hear them all. Okay, amazing. So I think we need to start with a clear sort of problem definition, right? We need to sort of identify which specific challenges AI is hoping to address within the organization. Yeah, we need to have a clear vision and mm -hmm. define goals and objectives for AI integration. I, I think that's sort of the starting point, right? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people just talk about AI, 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 and they think it's a sort of, you know, panacea and it's going to sort of solve all problems and whatever. We need to be focused, you know, what challenges are we trying to address? What are we trying to achieve? That's number one. I think we need to focus on value creation, right? So these initiatives have to align towards improving patient outcomes and operational efficiency. I, I, I think those are sort of, you know, the underpinning goals are worthy of sort of investment. I think we have to prioritize sort of digital strategy. So we have to ensure that we have high quality data for the reasons we discussed earlier, right? And it's critical for the effectiveness of the AI applications. It needs to be diverse and needs to be ethically sourced. Right? So th those things are critical underpinnings. We need to prioritize ethics. So just sort of moving on from that. Um, the initiatives need to comply with ethical standards and regulations, some of which we were discussing earlier. And we need to implement guidelines in order to make sure that the AI is used ethically and maintain transparency to all stakeholders. Right, um, And then we, you touched on it earlier, um, but you know, we need to foster a culture of innovation. You know, mm -hmm. people need to see this AI tool, AI as a tool and not a threat, right? Mm -hmm. And I think for that, organizations and bodies need to invest in training to allow people to really sort of, you know, hone their skills, understand, you know, how they can leverage AI and sort of become a bit more familiar with it. And, you know, it, it de-risks the proposition, I think, for people using it, you know, and other stakeholders. Um, I think we need to focus on interoperability because, you know, a big barrier we discussed earlier is the fact that, you know, it's difficult to integrate sort of, you know, these systems seamlessly within existing systems. So interoperability using cloud-based, you know, solutions, I think is something that absolutely necessary. I think we need to adopt a phased approach. So we need to start small and scale smart, right? So mm -hmm. implement AI in phases. You start with small pilot projects to measure outcomes, and then you demonstrate the value and scale up with successful initiatives. Mm -hmm. Don't, you know, go big and try to you know, do a, a huge overhaul. I think that will, the thing that will most likely achieve is a parochial resistance in the stakeholders you're trying to get to, you know, adopt this. And you need to collaborate strategically. So you need to partner with, you know, tech companies and academic institutions to really be sort of at like the vanguard, like, you know, the cutting edge of what's to come. Because again, I think it's different to, you know, revolutions that we've seen in technology before, the rate at which, you know, developments are coming, the rate at which this is accelerating. I think, you know, literally if we're talking about weeks, you're already behind. You know, yep. so it, it's absolutely necessary to have, you know, that breadth and to have, you know, other sort of people in at the cutting and leading edge of that mm -hmm. to advise 
um, and to steer. Um, we need to balance sort of AI with, you know, the human mm. touch as well, right? So mm -hmm. that, that, that effectively sort of ensuring and reassuring, you know, stakeholders that the AI is not there to replace them. They're not going to be supplanted by sort of, you know, the AI tools, but that it's there to act as a sort of complement to help mm -hmm. with decision making, to help with precision and accuracy of diagnostics, you know? And then finally, they, the companies, they need to stay agile for reasons we were discussed, right? So they need to be able to recognize that they may need to pivot at one point in time in order to sort of, you know, remain relevant, but predominantly to maximize the, or to sort of optimally leverage the sort of, you know, use of the various tools that are available. Yeah. Well, all very powerful words of wisdom. And I was thinking as we were talking, um, I would love to potentially even in six to 12 months, come back and have this conversation again and almost go back through the, the, the bullseye and see what's shifted and what's changed. Because, you know, as you said, things are probably going to change in weeks, um, not even months. Um, so, uh, yeah, I would love to see like some of the things you're talking about, where they are and have they come to life and, and how are these outcomes changing. But um, thank you so much for coming on here today. It's so great to get your perspective and your wisdom. And I hope when we do put this out there, um, healthcare professionals and business leaders, both in healthcare, but also different industries and different sectors, we talk a lot about the need for radical collaboration now because it's a different time, as you nicely signposted so hopefully this gets out here and that wisdom is um you know inspires others in, in the industry to take action so thank you so much for sharing your insight and uh, you, we're hopefully talking to you again soon wonderful thanks so much Lindsay. i appreciate that mm -hmm.